Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. I'm sure a few more people will show up as uh, we proceed. We're going to just do a, a quick review, but before we do that, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence. We are grateful for all that you have been doing in our lives. We know, Lord, that there's many things that we still need to learn. So we just ask that as we open your word together, that your Holy Spirit can speak to us, <clears throat> that it can interpret uh, the words of Scripture, and that we can make an application to our lives presently. We know, Lord, that um, Jesus will be returning soon, and we just pray that we can be ready and that we can uh, reveal your character to others, that they may welcome his coming. Be with us now in this study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick review, hopefully really quick review. Sometimes my reviews get a little not quick. But um, so with this document here um, that we're looking at, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, um, this is about the call to Samuel. And what we found is that there are uh, three times that Samuel is called, and he's going to believe that it's Eli who is calling him. Now, Samuel at this time is 12 years old. He's in the temple. That is, he's going to lie down to sleep from what we can see, from what the scripture says, is that he's in in the sanctuary itself, sleeping where the lamps of God are. And before they have gone out, which they would, of course, gone out in the morning, they would be extinguished. And because they're going to be trimmed in the morning, so it would probably be not really the middle of the night. It would be later on in the morning, but sometime in the night anyway. And when he goes to Eli each of these times that he hears his name called, Dwight noted that uh, the first time he's called, he responds, here am I. And then, and then he goes to Eli again and says, here am I. Then there's going to be two more times that uh, he goes to Eli. So there's the third time. And it's here that Eli is going to recognize that, um, that it's the Lord speaking to Samuel. Right? He gives him some instruction regarding that. Now, we have taken these three times that, that he is called to represent the first, second, and third angel's messages. And this is something that we've constantly seen as a pattern in the scriptures. So things that happen three times, three days, lots of different threes. So an application that, that we make is that this represents the first, second, and third angel's messages. Now, of course, those messages are first understood in connection with Millerite history. That is Revelation chapter 14, the Millerites, they, they recognize the first angel's message. And, and it's always to me rather peculiar that when uh, the Millerites were studying the scriptures and they would apply uh, the first angel's message, that they didn't really have a clear understanding of, of how the second angel's message applied or how the third angel's message applied even though that was right in front of them. And, and I've done a lot of study on the pioneer writings, the, the Millerite writings, and they didn't really seem to have any sort of recognition of the things that they couldn't see. That is, there is things that they didn't see that were right in front of them. And yet later on, they were able to recognize after the passing of time and this is, to me, something that, that is rather interesting about our perceptions. That is, things we don't know about, we don't see, we don't perceive. And, you know, why is it that way? Right? Why, why is it that, you know, I've used this example before where, um, you know, I was sent down by my wife to go get um, our, our box with our dishes in after potluck. And uh, to bring them upstairs and, you know, put them in the car. 
And I said, they're not down there. I was just down there. I didn't see a box. So she says, go down. You'll see it. It's right by the wall there in the kitchen. So I went down, looked, didn't see it, went back up. She said, no, it's there. Go down again. Went down a second time. Didn't see it. So the third time she went down with me and there it was right where she had said, right where I had been looking. And so, so why is it, I mean, maybe we don't understand exactly how our perceptions work, uh, but why is it that God has allowed us to see things or sometimes blinded our eyes to things that we should have seen? What is the purpose of that? I know I'm not asking the question in the best way, but what does this represent? The idea that that things are not understood until a certain point of time, even when they're right in front of our eyes. So why did the Millerites not really think about the second and third angels message, only focus on the first? And yet the second and third obviously must happen before Jesus returns. Anybody have an explanation for that? Is it possible that their their inability to recognize the pattern of the three calls where Samuel responded to Eli is the equivalent of the Millerites coming to an understanding of the first and second angel's message, but not fully understanding the third or the message of Revelation 18. Okay, but that's kind of, you're still just kind of reframing sort of what we see. So we know that they understood the first angel's message. They didn't understand the second angel's message until they got to that point of time, right? Correct. But but they still didn't understand the third angel's message, right? So they would recognize we're giving the first angel's message, and but we're expecting Jesus to come back, even though we're not really giving the second and the third angel's message. And then when they give the second angel's message, they recognize it, but they don't think about, well, how come we're not giving the third angel's message? Right? Why are we just giving the first and second? And then, you know, after they give the third angel's message, and even when they give the second angel's message, they connect it to Revelation 18 because they make a call to come out of Babylon. And yet that's not part of, of Revelation 14, right? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. It doesn't say come out of her, my people, right? That's in Revelation 18. So so they didn't mix Revelation 18 with, with the second angel's message, but they didn't really comprehend the third angel's message. And then after you know, Ellen, Ellen White connects that the, the angel of Revelation 18, which is the second angel's message repeated, she connects it with the Sunday law that's coming, right? So that's going to be uh, connected in the future. So, so they applied some things to their time that didn't actually apply to their time. And then other things that they could have applied, that they could have seen, they, they didn't see until later. Now, the question is why? What is the principle that's involved? Like Jesus told us, told his disciples things that were going to come to pass, that when they come to pass, they may believe that he says that you may believe that I am he, right? So Jesus told them things. Did they understand them until they came to pass? Did they know that Jesus was going to die and be resurrected? They'd Even been told, though, but it, they didn't comprehend. Right. So, so what is the principle involved here? How would we we put that? How how would we name it? How would we describe this principle? I don't know how to name it. Yeah. You're, okay. You're you're asking how how do we name this principle? And yeah. Well, what what scripture would we use particularly? What is this principle? I mean, we've. So we know that God's word is as a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. That is, we only see just in front of us. Right. Okay. And that means in order to advance down the path, we have to walk in the light. That we have to walk in the advancing light. Right. And But the light doesn't advance unless we walk in it. 
Okay. Right? Because if you're carrying a lamp, if you stand still, you're not going to see any further down the path. You have to walk. That is, you have to walk in the light. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if we have a single word or a phrase for this. You know, maybe we could coin some kind of phrase or something. But it is a principle. You know, we have we have um, Proverbs 4.18 that says, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a per the perfect day. So the path of the just, as we walk down that path, it shineth more and more. So, like so what we see, okay, uh, William? Yeah, it'd be like the quotes Miss White got said, if you don't take, take hold of the first angel message, you don't receive the session. How yeah, so, in life. Yeah. yeah, those who are not benefited by the first angel's message will not be benefited by the second angel's message. Right. So, so there is this progression. It's the, you know, so I don't know exactly, you know, some cogent way in which to describe it, but we know that if we don't obey the light that we have, we go into darkness. Now we also know that the light of the midnight cry, that's the light that comes from the message that was given in the summer of 1844. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. That's the midnight cry. And that's going to be first given on July 21st in 1844 and then repeated, empowered on August 15th, you know, 25 days later. So that light, Ellen White says, shines all along the path. And those that deny the light behind them will walk in darkness and, and fall off the path into the wicked world below something that's not exactly her words but basically what she says into the dark and wicked world below something like that so one of the things we know is that there's light in the path in the past that gives light for our path but if we don't continue to walk in that light that light goes out now god gives three messages three calls to samuel now Samuel, of course, is representative of a message, but also people are always connected to a message, right? That is a message. People receive a message. Now, Eli is going to give or going to receive this message from Samuel. That is, Samuel is going to be called. Eli represents the leadership. He's going to be passed by, and God's going to go to Samuel. And he's passed by because of his inability to to call out sin by its right name. That is, his sons, he excuses their sin. He doesn't, he, he turns a blind eye to those sins. But in that third call, Eli is going to recognize that it is the Lord that has been calling Samuel. And so we looked yesterday a little bit at um, Ezekiel chapter 20, when certain of elders of Israel come before Ezekiel. And, of course, that's the 10th day of the fifth month in Ezekiel 20, which is uh, the first date we had uh, July 18 Gregorian, which is July 31st Julian, or the other way around, July 18 Julian, which is July 31st Julian, which is, I'm doing it backwards, July 18 Julian is uh, July 31st Gregorian in 2020. This, these were the... That was the first date we had that symbolized July 18th. And we got that from Ezekiel, the 10th day of the fifth month. And then later we had the 26th day of the fourth month, which was July 18th, Gregorian in 2020. But we had this certain elders of Israel come and appear before Ezekiel. And Ezekiel represents this movement because this movement is represented by Samuel Snow. Now, is there any significance here that the one that's called here is Samuel? Would we connect Samuel here to Samuel Snow, the one who gave the midnight cry in 1844? It should be one that we, we can see and connect fairly easily. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and we did the same thing with Josiah Litch in connection with Josiah Litch using the prophecy of Josiah 
from 1 Kings 13 and 2 Kings 23, when it's given and when it's fulfilled, as the starting point for the 390 years and the 40 years to both end in 587 at the time of the siege, right? So we said, well, that's the prophecy of Josiah. And we connected it because there's 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah to the destruction of Jerusalem. And we connected to that 391 years and a half a month uh, from Revelation 9, which Josiah Litch opened up that prophecy. So we can see that we can connect Josiah, Josiah Litch, to the prophecy of Josiah. And we can connect Samuel Snow's message to to Samuel, right? And it's going to be the second angel's message. That is Samuel Snow. Miller gives the first angel's message. It's Samuel so Snow who gives the second angel's message. And we could see here in the story of Samuel that this is all about the second angel's message. And this movement has understood that Samuel Snow represents the second angel's message, the repetition of the second angel's message in Revelation 18. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's connected to the Sunday law. This whole movement is all about that second angel's message, which arrived at 9-11 when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. So, so we can see then that we have just this name connection from Millerite history that we used both with the Josiah and, and now here with Samuel. So it's something we never mentioned in the study yet, but, but, but that name connection has to be part of that. Now we know that we have uh, the three calls and the Lord just says Samuel. But here in 1 Samuel 3, verse 10, the Lord came and stood and called at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel answered, speak, Lord, speak for thy servant heareth, right? So the fact that this is doubled would connect this with Revelation 18, the repetition of the second angel's message in our time, right? And, and this would fit on Ellen White's line if Ellen White you know, the way that she looked at it, we had the first, second, and third angel's message. In Millerite history, the third angel's message arrives October 22nd, 1844. And she she talks about the second angel coming again with Revelation 18. And that that's since that's the second angel, and you can't have a second without a first, you can't have a third without a first and a second, that means the first angel's message has to be repeated. And she talks about the parable of the ten virgins in Millerite history and how that was fulfilled, and that it will, it has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter in the future, right? When it's repeated. And so this is something that generally Seventh day Adventists don't see. That is, I would say, not just generally, almost nobody sees. Now, if we go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, just the idea that something can't be seen until we see it, <laughs> even if we're told about it. I mean, it's it's amazing how human perception uh, works. Now, I mean, it's, it's, it's a part of our nature. It's just one of the things like, and we all know, you know, if, if you buy a new car that you've never owned that kind of car before, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere. You would never have noticed it before, you know, unless you're really a car guy. Right. So you just all cars kind of look the same uh, until you buy one. And then you notice cars that look like yours and they're everywhere. Generally, unless you have a very rare car. So go, so what is involved here? So going back to this principle, it has to do with obeying light. Right. That if if we don't obey the light that we have, we can't be given more light. And, and then we're not going to see things until we pass through those events. And, and we can see this here in this movement quite clearly, that as we pass through events in our history, then we could see our eyes were enlightened, right? You know, we ate of the little book, right? It was sweet in our mouths and it was bitter in our bellies. But when we ate of that, that honey, right, just as, as Jonathan did, 
he now, his eyes were enlightened. So as we're studying these things, we need to keep this, however we're going to call it, whatever we're going to call this principle, we need to keep this idea in mind that things unfold as we pass through these events. Okay. Now, I have a question based on, partially on what we were talking about yesterday, but okay. on our recognition of this verse. Now, we agree in our conversation that three times Samuel was called and three times he ran to Eli. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is not the third call, but this is the fourth, right? Yeah. And the way the verse reads, and the Lord came and yatsab and stood and called as at other times. Mm -hmm. So the one that is standing here is the Lord, is Jehovah, right? Yeah, yeah, that's Jehovah, which is, can be Christ. Right. Yeah. But he is standing and calling. Okay. This word is used multiple ways within prophecy, specifically in Habakkuk, specifically in Zechariah, specifically we also find it multiple times in Joshua, Judges, and as far back as Exodus. What should we make of the fact that Jehovah is standing and calling Samuel? Okay, well, normally we look at that as a close of probation when he stands, but um, let me see here. But close of probation for whom? Well, it can be different. I mean, he Michael stands up, close of probation for the world. Uh, we see Christ standing on the right hand of God, close of probation for ancient Israel. So um, is this close of probation for Eli and his house? Yeah, well, it could be, yeah. So if we are looking at this figuratively, does this represent close of probation for either the corporate church or for those of the movement that are choosing not to study and are rejecting the offer that that has been held out for them to, to be able to join in these studies? Yeah, well, so we have all different magnifications in which we could apply this, right? So, so you really what you're asking is what magnification are we applying this? Correct. Right. Now, now, as far as the word stood, it doesn't necessarily mean to stand, right? That's, it, that's why I referred it, to it as Yatsab. Yeah, and but it is a word that, like, who's standing with me? Like, who's with me, right? It can mean that, like, to take one stand or to station oneself. So it's not really the same as, like, just plain old standing. No, I mean, there, there's a couple of words right. that are used as stand. I mean, I look at Habakkuk 2, verse 1, and the word that is there used for stand is different from what we're dealing with here. Yeah, it, often we see amad which really means like to stand up, right? Um, but so, but even though we can still understand it as stand, you know, but he stood, I mean, that is he placed himself, you know, he remained, but there's lots of different ways in which it could be understood. So, in, so, I mean, we do know that there's a close of probation in, in connection with this message, with any message. There comes a point in which there's a close of probation, a three-step testing prophetic message. So all I'm, that's all I'm saying about it. Okay. I mean, we can still apply it that way, but I just want to make it clear that it's not the same word as a mod, which is often the word like to stand up. Like when Michael stands up, that's a mod. But when, I, when I'm looking at this, like in Exodus 2, verse 4, and his sister stood afar off to wit, what would be done to him. So 
we're referring here to Moses' sister standing afar off. She is set aside. She is separate from the Egyptians. Yeah, and she just remains, right? So, I mean, they could have said she remains afar off, right? It doesn't necessarily mean a person is standing, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Like on her feet, right? She could be sitting, and they would still translate it as his sister stood afar off, right? But is the word itself does not necessarily mean that a person is on his feet. But in this situation, also yeah. comparing this with Habakkuk 2 verse 1, we have, I will stand upon my watch and will set me upon the tower. And it's yeah. the setting, the separation, the placement on the tower that is Yatsab. Mm -hmm. So is this, okay, the Lord. Yeah, you're going to have a mod, I will stand upon my watch and then set. That's Yasab. Correct. On the tower, right? Correct. Yeah. But what I'm what I'm looking at here is, and what the question I'm asking, is this final call, the separation that separates Samuel from Eli and his house? Based upon and stood? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that the stood there is is related to that. Okay. Because it just says the Lord came and stood. So it means just the Lord, he's placed there, right? That is, he's remaining and he's giving a message. So this isn't people that are standing, right? So the only stood that I would connect, if you're going to say that it's, it has to do with that final call or something. I mean, obviously, Michael's standing up, but it's not the same word. But I still think we could use it in connection with the close of probation, but not not for the reasons that you're using. If that makes sense. Okay. Right. But we already understand that this is the fourth angel's message. Because we have the three calls, first, second, and third angel's message, and this is the fourth. And so it's a basic structure that this story has that we've seen in dozens of other stories. So the, th the three, the three and the one. Correct. Okay. Now, now you had talked about how uh, there's five times because you had the here am I, which Sam is going to say twice at the first call, but there's actually only four times because the second time he doesn't say here am I. He says, speak for thy servant here. But we are going to have a fifth here am I when Eli calls Samuel to hear what the Lord has said to Samuel. Right. right? So there is five times he says, here am I. Right. But only three of those or four of those are connected with the first three calls. The fourth call doesn't have that except when Eli calls him. And if Eli represents the leadership, uh, how do we account for Eli calling Samuel and him responding with the here am I? That is, you know, even though we take that there's there's a point in which the leadership has, you know, it's been passed by, right? So Eli is passed by. God is going to go to Samuel instead of to the leadership. Okay. Now, so, and another point that we need to to think about is is Samuel's going to be twelve years old. What's the significance of twelve years in connection with our history? Number of disciples. Um, twelve years. Yeah. Okay. Not twelve. I was looking at the number. That's all. Yeah, I'm asking about year specific. Are you speaking of 2001 to 2013 or? No, 1989 to 2001, as Angela has noted. Okay. Right. So we had lined up Christ's life with the time of the end. Christ is born at the time of the end in, in his line. When he's 12, that's when he's going to go uh, to the temple at the Passover, right? And then he's going to be baptized when he's uh, uh, about 30 years of age, right? And so that's when he becomes, that's the age you become a priest, Christ is going to be 30 when he's baptized. So 
that 12 and that 30, we lined that up with September 11th or November 9th, 1989 to September 11th, 2001. That's the 12 years. And then the remainder going to November, uh, not November, did I say November 9th, 1989, 12 years to September 11th, 2001. And then November 9th, 2019 is the 30 years. Right. So we had lined up that 12 and that 30 years with our history. So if we're saying that this is about 9-11, the fact that Samuel is 12 would be significant to line up with 9-11. OK, that makes sense. Okay. OK, so what I'm saying is we have all kinds of symbols that mark this as 9-11. Not as the close of probation for the church, which would be the Sunday law itself, though we know that 9-11 is connected to the Sunday law. That is, we've been in the time of the Sunday law since 9-11. And, you know, that began, of course, with the Patriot Act and, and all of the events that have happened that have taken away our liberties, which ultimately will lead to the removal of our religious liberty in connection with keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. Right. So the Sunday law in its progression really arrived at 9-11, where most Seventh-day Adventists were just looking for, you know, one day they'd open up the paper and we'd go and get the morning paper. This is our sort of visualization that we would have had in the 90s or you'd hear it on the news and it'd be announced, you know, Sunday law, you know, and then and then we would just know what to do at that time because we knew that Saturday was the Sabbath. But this progression of Sunday law is more akin to, you know, a frog being in a pot of water that's going to be heated up and being brought to a boil that the frog doesn't really recognize it. And so for Seventh-day Adventists, as we have been progressing towards the Sunday law, there is, with especially within the church and the leadership, this, this idea, there's not going to be a Sunday law coming anytime soon. In fact, many people don't believe in the Sunday law at all, right? That that was just some old fashioned thing that we had that was part of our history, but you know, that's, that's not ever going to happen. Right. So now, now we know that the Sunday law is not going to happen, you know, next week, you know, probably not this year, you know, probably not for a couple of years, but we can see the preparations being made as we progress through this, uh, sort of, well, I'll use the word brainwashing that's gone on. So it, it's conditioning people to accept the Sunday law, to give no resistance. So they keep pushing you to a, a crisis. It never turns out as bad as it was. And so every time that crisis comes, you know, the sky is falling or whatever it is, or boy crying, calling wolf, people just become conditioned to, not respond anymore, right? So there's lots of different illustrations that could be given. But we would have to say that this, this message here is just representing this whole message. It's, it's our history, it's 9-11, the history of 9-11, which, which includes a lot more than 9-11, right? It includes November 9th, 2019 as well, and July 18, 2020. Any more thoughts on this? Any any no. ideas? As as we have been talking, I was I was looking back over this on the here am I. Yeah. And the pattern is kind of interesting because in verse four, we are told that the that the Lord, that Jehovah called Samuel, and he Samuel answered, here am I. Yeah. And he ran to Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. So there's two responses. He's responded once to yeah. the Lord, once to Eli. Yeah. Verse 6, he's called yet again. Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here am I. And Eli answered, I called not my son, lie down again. So you have once to the Lord. Once to Eli. Yeah, well, once to the Lord, he doesn't know who's called him. Okay, 
And he may have been actually been calling out like to Samuel, but then goes to Samuel and then it goes to him. So, so I mean, I know the Lord called him, but he doesn't know that. Okay. I, I misspoke. So here, here we have once that he's responding to the Lord twice now that he's responded to Eli. Under the second time. Yeah. So, okay. Now, the third, the third call, he arose and went to Eli. So now we have one. We have three times he's now gone to Eli, right? Yeah. And Eli perceives that it's the Lord. So on the fifth call, the fifth for the fifth response, Samuel responds, speak for thy servant heareth. He doesn't say, here am I. He speaks, and he's so shocked that the Lord is speaking to him that he forgets the exact words that Eli has told him. Yeah, because Eli said, speak, speak the Lord for thy servant, servant heareth. Correct. Yeah. Now, now, it could be that he actually did say, Lord, it just doesn't record that, but, but that's what's recorded here. So he just says, speak for thy servant heareth. Yeah. So now, Samuel lays until morning. And opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And Samuel answered, here am I. Yeah, so that's the fifth time he says, here am I. Right. So the pattern is kind of interesting that he responds first to Jehovah. And then three times to Eli, then responds again to Jehovah, and then finally responds to Eli the last time. Yeah, though it's not a here am I the second time to God. No, I understand that. Yeah. I'm just looking at the responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm still not sure that the first time it's to Jehovah. Like, obviously, God, the Lord calls him. But he still believed it was Samuel that was called or Eli that was calling him. Right. So Correct. Samuel, so Samuel just, you know, I'm here. Right. Right. And then he goes to Eli. So I don't think he knows because it's clear. He doesn't know it's the Lord that's calling him. So, yeah, I don't know if I would put it as that he responds to Jehovah. At least I wouldn't put it that way. Other people may disagree. I guess it just depends how you look at it. But. Okay. Now, from what, in in responding to one of the questions in the chat, I, I'm i unaware of any kind of a, um, like, naming ceremony in the Jewish tradition that within the Catholic hierarchy that they would recommend adopting the name of a patron saint doesn't surprise me. Okay. Um, and yes, the bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah is normally done at about 12 years of age. I thought it was at 13. Isn't it 13 that they have their bar mitzvah? Just a minute. I've heard both. Well, they have to at least be 12, right? So I guess it depends. But I'm pretty sure it's 13. We know Jesus, he's 12 years old when he... He goes to the temple and talks to the priests, and, and his parents lose track of him. But I, I believe it's 13. Okay, the Orthodox have the boys celebrating bar mitzvah at 13 and the girls bat mitzvah at 12. Oh. In Reform, Reconstructionist, and Conservative, the 13-year-old age is the milestone regardless of gender okay yeah but but i think that the 12 is is a more ancient i think the 13 was done for some other reason if what i remember that it was kind of like well we've got to make sure that we don't like we're erring on the side of caution so to speak but but i could be wrong about that but i think the idea originally it was 12 but it, it's not practiced I guess, except for the for the girls. Okay. So um, 
So when we look at these statements here, this is going to be a bit of a review as well because we've looked at some of these statements. So these verses, the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision, right? So we, we've been we've been saying that uh, within Adventism, so if we're going to put this whole story in the context of Adventism, where in the fourth generation of Adventism, it's, you know, God is not really speaking to his church directly anymore, right? And, and we dealt with Ellen White's open visions and parallels and so forth. So it's at the time when the understanding of prophecy has been set aside that we're going to have this message. Now, of course, we say that this can refer to Millerite history, these three angels' messages. But if we apply them to the church, how would we apply these three? Or is there some other way in which we could do this? You understand what I'm asking? No. Okay. So we we have these three calls. And and we could say that the three calls are just Millerite history, and the fourth is our history. That would be Ellen White's perspective, right? From her, from the way that she lays out the lines. But can we apply the three calls to our history itself? I would think we should. Yeah. And so if we should, where would we do that? When in the movement did we all, or those who were present in the movement, then uh, say or vow to return to the old past? Like when was it officially saying, stated? Because this was before my time. Okay. Well, 1989 is when Jeff first understands the repeat of Millerite history, that we're repeating Millerite history. He doesn't yet understand that it's in 1989 because he he hasn't studied yet, right? He just his, his sees this in the spirit of prophecy, something which I had never seen. I'd never seen this repeat of history, but he saw it, <laughs> right? So as far as I know, he's the first one that sees this, that we repeat Millerite history. And um, now... So that's going to be in 1989 he starts those Bible studies. Obviously, in 1989, you have the fall of the Soviet Union, and and Jeff begins to recognize that that's prophetically significant in connection with uh, what Louis F. Weir had shown about Daniel 11, verse 40, that you have the, the fall of the papacy, 1798. That's the, the king of the south pushing against the king of the north, right? And then the king of the north is going to come against the king of the south. So you have 1798, the papacy is taken down by France, and then, which is the king of the south, and then in 1989, the Soviet Union, which inherits that title, the, the symbols of that, is taken down by the king of the north, along with the armies that of the United States, right? So they take down the Soviet Union. So when Jeff recognizes that, I mean, it, it's going to unfold in that history, but that would be the first angel's message. That would be the first call, right? Now it has two responses to it. Here am I. Could Would that connect to November 9th, 1989 and December 25th, 1991 as symbols? Well, being that this was this this was a was a prophecy in Samuel's time about the the fall of Eli's house, couldn't it parallel the fall of the Soviet Union? The, well, I don't know if Eli's fall, house the fall of the papacy. It, it would have to deal with the Seventh Day Adventist Church in that history, not the Soviet Union. Not the fall of Eli's house is the fall of of the institutions of Adventism. Okay. So right. well, I'm also okay because I see all these parallels of well because um, these are false. So, so so we, we so, thought would last forever. Some people would thought that it was permanent, right? I mean, even my mother was a Catholic. She said the church will last forever, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now we're going to see see the papacy with the U.S. bringing down the U.S. the the U.S. as we know it to be, which is based on its constitution. Okay, so. Yeah, so this is dealing with the the United States, the Protestants of America joining hands with 
you know, spiritualism the and with the papacy, right? So these 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 are progressions of things that happen. You're sort of going a bit different direction, but the idea here is that we have the two here am I's, right? Here am I. And and I'm saying that that rep could represent these two events, November 9th, 1989, and December 25th, 1991, which is that 777 days in which the fall of the Soviet Union occurs, right? So obviously, November 9th, 1989 is generally the period that's marked. So when you have the, the Berlin Wall yeah. taken down, right? right? But we know there's 777 days until the Soviet Union falls. And so we could say in some ways that this response of Samuel, that is, this movement, particularly Jeff, is, is in the understanding of these events, right? That the here I am, or here am I, is, is is representative of God's people or of this message or of Jeff, however you want to look at it, recognizing God's call, but not really fully re understanding it, right? That is, Jeff is so responding in the same way that Samuel is responding, like he's receptive, but he does not yet recognize mm -hmm. what this message is. All it entailed. Yeah. Right. It, it unfolds bit by bit. Right. So so Jeff is still, you know, totally, totally supportive of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at that time. Right. He's he's a new Seventh-day Adventist. Right. He'd only been an Adventist for, you know, a few years. I can't remember exactly. His, he was baptized around the same time I was. You know, I was baptized. So December, April, again, April. there's a parallel because Samuel confused Eli's voice with God's voice, it sounds like. And so yeah. Jeff, still having loyalty to the SDA church, would think that, well, this is a message that everybody in the SDA church is going to receive, right? It's God's right. voice. So therefore, the church, which is supposed to be God's church, will receive it. But they didn't. Some did, but very few did. Mm -hmm. Right. So now it, there's going to come a point in which we come to understand that that it was God's voice speaking to us. Now, Eli is also going to recognize that it was God's voice, right? So, so we know Eli is yeah. passed by. We know Eli is passed by. That is, the leadership is passed by. The message is going to go to, to Samuel, right? The one that God has chosen. Now, you know, in, in I have never been the type of pe person who, you know, looks for faults in the church um, and wants to judge, you know, our leadership or my pastor or anything like that. I've always been very supportive of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And, and we can liken that to David. He would not slay the Lord's anointed, right? He had the opportunity to yeah. kill Saul, but he didn't, right? That is, we have respect unto the institutions that God has sent, set up. But that doesn't mean that there, that there comes a point in which those institutions, God deals with them. So sometimes people sort of take this work into their own hands, which I don't think is wise. That is, you know, who are we, right? And David even was anointed. <laughs> he, could have, he could have said, well, I was anointed by God. I'm the rightful king. You know, he could have killed Saul. But he didn't, right? And... And I think that's really important. The people who are ready to rebel um, are not of, after God's heart. That is, we need to trust that God knows what he's doing. And which means, you know, we have to live the truth. We have to do what's right. Um, we have to stand up for what's right. We have to accept the consequences of our actions in in choosing what is right. But in this movement, as Jeff goes through this movement, I mean, he has the first angel's message, and that's primarily the message that Jeff gives. And then we have 9-11 um, happens, and that's the arrival of the second, as well as the empowerment of the first. So that unfolds all kinds of light. So prior to that, if you go, and we've studied it, we've studied Jeff's messages prior to 9-11, he's not really that much different than 
many Adventists in, in how he's looking at the church and how he's looking at the Sunday law. The only thing that he has different is that he understands the reform lines and also that we are repeating Millerite history in some way, right? Now, when he originally does this, he has these three way marks, you know, the first, second, and third, right? Lining up with the first, second, and third angels' messages in, in Millerite history. And, and he's going to mark, you know, 1989, uh, the Sunday law and the close of probation, right? He doesn't have 9-11 in there. As time goes on and events unfold, he continues to zoom into these way marks, right? So that is, he, and, and people who are following Jeff, many people think he's moving the way marks, right? So they criticize him for this and people fall away from the movement as Jeff receives more light. Some people accept that light that Jeff is receiving. Some people don't, right? So when we get to 2016, we have a model of these way marks. We have the second way mark is split into two, midnight and the midnight cry. They're really one way mark. They're a doubling. But we have 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. And, you know, we don't have 1989 on that line anymore, right? We don't have the close of probation on that line. We just, we've zoomed in and Jeff hasn't realized what he's done, right? He hasn't fully understood it. So, you know, exactly how we address Eli at this point, is Eli the same Eli that we have at the beginning? That is, is it the same leadership that's being addressed or is this a different leadership? Right. Is this still about the Seventh-day Adventist Church in response to this message that there comes a point where so it, it, that at the Sunday law that this is recognized? And that's the way that I would look at it. I was like what we took from Ezekiel chapter 20 is that there comes a point because Eli is inquiring of Samuel. Samuel represents this message. And then we're saying, you know that, what, I. Sorry, um, I'm thinking that when when the Sunday law comes and the church is so extremely polarized and split and there, there are people that will plainly accept the mark of the beast, they will go with Sunday. I even had a dream about that a few years ago. Yeah. And then those who realize when we receive the mark, we are we are going to be burnt, like we're going to be totally lost. We want to be loyal to Christ. We want to be loyal to to the foundations of this church. Those are the people that are going to inquire. Yeah, but that will include some of the leadership. Here? But it must include some of the yeah, leadership. It's, 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 it's mostly the laity, of course, what we call the laity, which we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all supposed to be <clears throat> priests of God. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I've got a really bad blend here. And so I, you know, this is this is what I'm seeing now. I mean, I see it. I see it in this movement too. Where are we going? I, are we going to choose to advance in truth and to reform our characters, or are we just going to fall back and take what is easy to accept, like this thing with Trump? That's that's what I'm seeing anyway. Things that are easy to accept, they're easy to see, they're easy to prove with our reasoning and with what we perceive with our senses. Yeah, and as as we move through this history, we'll understand it more. But but what I do see, and I think I'm you're agreeing with me and I'm agreeing with you, is that when we get to, because this would represent the Sunday law proper, right? Not necessarily 9-11 when we get to the fourth, because we're saying this whole thing is about a zoom into 9-11. That is, we look, and we did this with judges, right? We saw that judges was about 9-11. It was a zoom into 9-11, and it marked way marks in our history. And many people in this movement, with July 18th, you know, they wanted to have some kind of vindication. It was like winning the spiritual lottery. You know, if we were right, and you know, sort of make we'd be on easy street as far as witnessing to our family and friends. But in reality, we we were unprepared for anything that was coming if that event had occurred. You know, we were not Christ-like in any sense, and so. So that we would have to say that these first three calls, 
our, our, our three dates, right? We would have to, or three messages that have been occurred. So we could say, you know, the first one, Samuel's called, that's going to be connected with Jeff's call. And then the second one, that would be connected with something in, in the movement that doesn't necessarily. So we could have it, you know, 1989, 9-11, uh, and then 11 19 right? November 9, 2019, as the third one. But we don't see Eli at that third call recognizing, unless we're saying that that's all part of our history now, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Um, so, so the leadership is going to recognize that this is the Lord and, and tell Samuel, you know, speak Lord for thy servant heareth. And then we're going to have this fourth call, right, in which this message is received by Samuel about Eli's house and what's going to happen. And then Eli is going to inquire of Samuel, right? So I, I know on Sunday, I want to, um, before Sunday comes, I want to be able to draw this out and, and go through this line. So we, you know, trying to understand what we mean by the leadership and is it consistent throughout this line? Is it the same leadership? Is this talking about the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church the entire time? I would think it would have to be. So it's, it's things that we have to consider that we haven't, we haven't sorted through yet. Is that making sense? My ramblings making any sense? Well, certainly something to to ponder. Also, when you're talking about David not willing to slay Saul, when he certainly could have many times. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Paul <clears throat> when he when he rebuked the high priest and he called him a whited wall because <clears throat> the high priest had slapped him. And then when he was told that's the high priest, he said, oh, I'm not supposed to speak evil of the leaders of my people. Now, I mm -hmm. find that really hard to do because I focus a lot on how people blow it, how I blow it. I'm very critical. Like I'm very perfectionistic, very self-righteous. <laughs> the Lord is dealing with me about that. But I, I notice things that are just so blatantly wrong that they they actually upset me physically and mentally yeah but if god treated you that way you and i know he reminds me of that well haven't i had patience with you haven't i had patience with you look at how much i put up with you you know Ugh. yeah you know and yeah. we had this discussion you know and, and and i i say that i don't give up on people and <laughs> You know, one is people don't affect me as much. So it's pretty easy for me not to, you know, like like somebody wrote on one of the comments about you know, some relationships she had had, and, you know, um, and, and how destructive that was to her. Now, and I'm not saying that nobody could destroy me. I mean, obviously it's possible somebody could, but I've never had a relationship where, you know, I was destroyed, you know, I mean, there's hard things I've been through, but n nobody has ever been able to, you know, make my life miserable. And that's You're just very blessed. Right. Yeah, and I, I just think it has to do with how I was raised, right? And, you know, and probably some some mental defect I have as well. But, you know, I'm just not caught up in other people's emotions. Um, other people can't, like, manipulate me emotionally because I'm not, yeah, There's not anything I, there, right? I have been because the thing is I'm an empath and I pick up on so many different things. And yeah. if, if, if people are going through something and I'm aware of it, then I will take on at least a portion of, of that. And, and I was in therapy for this. And, yeah. and the therapist was actually calling me Ms. Fix It. You cannot be the savior of these people. Work on yourself. And I'm still learning that. And I've learned a lot. I've really learned a lot. And I said, I have to set up these firm boundaries. Yeah. And, so, and so I figured yeah. the only way I can do that is it's like I've asked God to put a spiritual force field around me where whatever so, so, is going on is not going to affect me the way it way it usually would. Yeah. So the practical application of this in, is in relationship to the church as well. There are some people that they're better off not being involved with the church, you know, from a spiritual point of view, right? And and there are relationships that people need to avoid. 
right? But the, to me, that's sort no, of no, a no. different uh, of, of not giving up on individuals. It doesn't mean I have to actively and be involved with an individual all the time, but I'm not going to write people off just because of their present situation. And if God directs me to minister to that person or to make clear to that person that I'm always available for them, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to actively seek them out and try to fix them. I don't try to fix anybody. But but you understand what I mean is if we need we need to understand this in the context that even though God has cast off to some degree uh, the church in its in its role, he has not cast off individuals. Right? Exactly. Has, and we, we still need to minister to individuals. And I understand the whole feeling that people have about like criticism of the church, because to me, it is it for, for many people, it's self-destructive to criticize others. One is it's it's never going to help you it's, and it's not going to help them. <laughs> and um, and we need to recognize why why we're so emotionally uh, distraught by other people's behavior right now. Obviously, you know, we could say, well, it's just because I care. But often it's not a lot of caring shown when we're criticizing others, right? It, you, you understand what I'm saying? So in this yeah, context, when it comes... There's some people that I, I really minister to, like I've given so much to. And when, as it says in Psalms, when, when hatred is returned for your love, you know, and it's happened in my life often and you know like i have to say i just have to set up these these boundaries i cannot get involved with these toxic people but i'm yeah. living with some of them now and and yeah, I, but, feel that I know you I always want to go this direction angela but but it's just you can see why it's not really productive yeah to, so i just right, right. keep my <laughs> my my distance as much as possible yeah and and sometimes people have to do that so uh, but that that doesn't so that in a sense that's a different issue than about giving up on people, right? We don't have to necessarily be involved with them in order to to pray for them and consider their good and, I do pray and to be them. there to be there if they do need us, right? In in the right circumstances, right? Yeah, but, if they will ask, ask, ask a question say about health or something, I'll answer, but that's it. Yeah. So when it comes to the church, I, I've never really written off the church. Um, you know, and again, I, I I don't think of the church as like this institution. Like to me, it's always about people. So, I mean, I know lots of different people. You know, some of them are ministers, some of them aren't. I, I don't, you know, stand in judgment of them and believe that they're lost or anything like that. I will still always be friends to people who've been mean to me. Um, and who have tried to do me harm, I don't have any ill feelings towards them because I don't I don't really cons- take any of it personally, right? Because it's not about me; it's really more about God's God than anything else. So when it comes to the church and this issue of Eli, which is really what we're looking at in this leadership, we we do have to believe that many of the people who have criticized this message have criticized us individually, at some point will in come to inquire of the Lord. And the message that's Amen. going to be given is that basically your leadership is going to be removed, right? That this thing that you have trusted in, the church, the organizational structure, it's, it's coming to an end, and you can't count on that anymore, right? Now, exactly. He, well, I learned that... that. By 2013, I realized that this is pretty hopeless. We're going nowhere. I, Lord, I am right. dying here. I am dying on, on the vine. What more but can the, I do? Right. But the people who have jumped the gun. So all the time that I've been in Adventist, there's always been this, this group that says the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. Right. Now, those people really don't have anything to offer. They're, they're very bitter. They usually have all kinds of fanatical ideas. Often it's, you know, it's just a self-justification of their own actions, why they have problems with the church. Maybe they've been hurt by individuals. You know, uh, often they fall away into the world. So I've seen many of these people who've been, you know, the so-called reformers of Adventism 
just go off into the world, right? So, so obviously the message that they were giving, even though there's some truth to it about the problems within the church, it never did anything to help them. And it never did anything to help anyone else. And, you know, so I've always been reluctant to, to judge the church in some kind of, you know, as an institution or to judge individuals within the church, even though I know evil exists, even though I know that the church is in apostasy and that it has rejected its foundation. So our faithfulness in hearing God's voice is important in order to re- reach the church, right? The condemnation of the church, even though we need to stand up for what is right and we don't, we don't condone sin, we don't, you know, paint it over and, and try to ignore it. It doesn't mean that we go out in full attack against the church because that's not going to do any good for us. What, what we have to do is respond to God's voice and what God is, is calling us to do. And remember, it's going to be Eli who goes to Samuel to hear what it is that the Lord has said, right? Mm-hmm. So, so our, our responsibility is to become like Christ, to heed mm-hmm. the call of Christ and to be, to be changed so that when we do give a message to the church, it's a message that's not one of condemnation. Part of the problem that I see, and again, you know, this is my experience, is that the people who call themselves reformers have done more damage to the truth by how they have tried to reform the church, how they have tried, you know, the types of message they give to, to their pastors or to church members. It, it's a condemnatory, self-righteous message that isn't going to help anyone, right? And, and I see it manifest all through Facebook in people attacking the church. And yet, when I look at this, me. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> I, I put some really heavy, heavy condemnation. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know you do. Right. Thoroughly but, disgusting. Yeah, and I don't think it's a good idea, personally. I don't think okay. it, it helps anyone. Right. But but I've seen these 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 individuals. Um, I've dealt with some of them, some of them I know personally. And they're not healthy individuals and they're they're not doing any good. They're just doing damage. And and, you know, and of course, if we say something like, you know, there's people who presented the twenty five twenty to the church and and, uh, you know, we know I know Tabo and, and what he did uh, in Newfoundland and the response that that created and the prejudice it created to this movement here in Alberta when Tabo moved to Alberta. And, you know, his his whole method, he would go from church to church in the Edmonton area and uh, try to get a following, right? And then, of course, people would kind of figure out what he was about, so he'd have to find another church to go to. He wasn't doing anything really to help promote this message in, in any kind of reasonable way. And very dismissive and very very self-righteous, not that I'm, you know, don't have any problem, you know, like I don't hate Tavo or anything. I'm just saying the way that he was coming across, the way that he was doing things, he was inexperienced. He was just a new Adventist and didn't really know. He didn't have any kind of patience with people. He didn't have any sort of love Mm -hmm. or concern with people. From my perspective and the people that he dealt with in my house in Bible studies, uh, you know, my best friend Sheldon, you know, he wrote him off. I mean, he really wrote me off as well, right? Because I didn't accept everything that he was telling me. Um, so, so you know, we we have this problem where we have a message that's been given to us, and we have to. This is this is a precious message, but it's meant to bring people to Christ. It's not meant to drive people away from God. And, and so often people who profess to believe this message, profess to be reformers, are doing more to drive people away from the truth than anything. And we've all been guilty of that. I, I include myself in that as well. Many things that I've done that, that have done have been a hindrance to giving a message to help people. You know, and I, I repent of those things. I mean, I, I, 
some of those, some of the things I've done and said in the past, I cringe at, but it's part of, yeah, you know, you know, especially when I first became an Adventist uh, and I understand it, you know, when I see it with other people. Uh, so I'm not saying that, you know, these people are all bad people. It's something we have to learn. But if we're going to see what this, this is saying here about Eli, about the leadership, that it's that we shouldn't, even though God has passed by the leadership, he's passed by the organization to give a message. That message is primarily to be given to the church. And it will be given when the church, when the leadership inquires of the Lord, that certain of the elders of Israel inquire of the Lord. Right. They go to Ezekiel to inquire. Right. And right. and Eli here, they he's going to go to Samuel. Some of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So 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 we can have confidence that what God has been doing, if we are faithful, that that will that will put us in a position where this message that we are developing, because we're still don't fully understand it, will be will be something that people will want to know about. And, Amen. And he has promised to take away the stony heart and give us a heart of yeah. flesh. So that's one of the promises I'm going to stand on. Yeah. And, and, and I know, I know I do harsh and critical. Yeah. And it won't be to, you know, to our pride, you know, it won't be like something where we will be, oh, you know, I'm sure glad that people are coming to me now. It vindicates me and, you know, had all these. No, criticism. I don't, I don't want that. In fact, somebody asked me years and years ago, said, you 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 ought to be leading these 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 people. It wasn't wasn't due to the church. It was it was to do with something else. And I said, well, when I look over my shoulder, there's no one following. I said, I'm not a leader. I'm a nonconformist. There's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, but that was in 2005, and this is quite a quite a ways since. But. Yeah, and, and and you know as. Um... Dare Elliot Trudeau said, you should, well, how did he put it? Something about anybody who wants uh, to be a leader or to have power or something, you, sh you shouldn't trust them. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. And then, and then the guy asked him, uh, well, do you want power? And he says, uh, not, not very much or something to that effect. I can't remember. It's, huh. it's really funny the way he, the truth. I read, I read his life story. The guy was an absolute horror in his home. He was a total tyrant and, and, and a pedophile. No, I don't want that type but, of leadership. Anyway, Thank well, you very much. Yeah, besides all that, the point <laughs> is, I mean, he, he, he knew, he knew that, 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 that truism that people who want to be leaders, but he really, he wanted to be a leader, right? So, you know, um, I don't want it. but, but, you know, the problem with being a leader is that you, you become responsible for things. And exactly. Thing, I ran a household on my own for many years and they're all very strong willed, just like me. It was yeah. terrible. It was a battle zone. But the, but the point is we, we will have a character of Christ and that's why people will want to hear what we have to say. And, and it won't be about us, right? It won't be about us being vindicated or anything like that. And, and and I think that is kind of a problem within Adventism. To a large degree, you know, when I first became an Adventist, I recognized that many Adventists, the only reason they wanted people to join the church is to sort of confirm that they, that they're, that they were right. You know, that when people join the church, it's like, oh, you know, see, people are joining the church. That means we're not a bunch of, you know, we're not a cult. And, um, but they didn't really have much interest in the people themselves and, and definitely not wanting right. the people to be individuals and to grow on their own mm -hmm. and to give freedom. You know, so I wasn't really very impressed with the church in, in how it in how it tried to relate to me. And and even the type of flattery that people would try to use, you know, in in the church, like giving you positions of responsibility and so forth and trying to make you feel like a part of the group and all that. I'm never really good at being parts of groups. Um, but, you know, it just wasn't how I was raised. Right. So, you know, it, it, it the church just never set well with me, you know, in, in what was expected in the social environment. So, so I have that, I guess, 
advantage maybe or disadvantage, however you want to look at it. But but I do know that um, the thing that is important is that we reflect Christ's character. So it doesn't matter what position, where what our social standing is, uh, how we're considered within the church, how we're considered within the world. What really matters is what God thinks about us. And and our own self-respect, right? What we think about our, ourselves. Because that, that's the person we have to live with the most, is us. And so when we ask the question, am, am I following God? Like yesterday, the study we had, you know, to me it was very convicting. I don't know if anybody remembers the study from yesterday. But, but I, you know, I just see my insufficiencies. And, and I can also see how God's patience with me and with others. And, Amen. you know, we need to fully trust God. You know, and it helped me make a decision yesterday, an important decision in my life, too, the study from yesterday. Because, you know, as I face some of the trials ahead of me, you know, there's this natural tendency to, to seek human aid to solve my problems. And and I've just, you know, thrown everything upon God and said, you know, God, whatever happens. And, of course, I do this every once in a while. But, you know, because sometimes you get caught up in worry about the things that are coming. And I just have to trust that God knows what's coming and that he's foreseen it all and that he will equip me. He, I will be in the place where God wants me to be no matter what happens if I trust in God. And, and so I don't really need to worry about what's going to happen. But sometimes I do, right? Yeah, same here. But, you know, the, and I say, Lord, you know my plight. You know, all, all of the circumstances. I have lessons to learn here. Please show me what you... What you want me to learn? Help me to get get the victory over self mainly, and it's a daily battle because there's so many provocations and patience, and so many disappointments, so many delays. And I figure this is all for my refinement. Help me to accept that. Yeah, delays, delays, delays. You know. Oh man, and frustration. I mean, it's just I think. Well, he, he promised never to give me more than I can bear. So, Lord, this seems unbearable. Yeah. Please help well, me to see, bear it. <laughs> it may, maybe it would be better if I was more impatient. You know, the problem is I'm so patient. I'm extremely go- impatient. So I have oh. to learn patience. And this is a real good, good way to learn it. But, yeah, I, I, I can wait for a long time. But sometimes, it, it you know, there's other things connected with waiting that uh, because you would like to see things resolved. And so when exactly. you have to wait, and wait and wait and things get delayed <laughs> again and again, then you start to think, you know, what's what's going to happen. But but I know that God's in charge. And especially with, you know, all of the studying that we're doing, it's not. It, I mean, we're learning a lot, but it's more the spiritual lessons that come from this that, that have been really important that I don't think we could have learned if we hadn't gone through this whole course of study, at least for me, you know, beginning about 2010. Same here. Yeah. Okay. Still Any final very thoughts? Much yeah. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Well, let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and for the studies this week. We pray for the study tomorrow evening and, and studies on Sabbath. We ask that we can glorify you your name to all around us. And I pray for each one. I know that we're all facing trials uh, that are revealing to us our need of you. And so may your angels watch over us. May your Holy Spirit continue to speak to our hearts. And may we respond to your voice and not the voice of the enemy. We pray this in Jesus' name.